By the time I was teaching computer science at Cambridge, a really terrible thing had happened. This had happened. So this is a graph of the collapse in the number of applicants to study computer science at Cambridge. We admit about 80 or 90 students here with computer science. And we went over the course of about five years from having over 500 applicants, so six applicants for every place, down to having a couple of applicants for every place. Um, and the thought that came to our mind, a group of us who were in the middle of kind of worrying about what this meant for the future of, uh, for the future of computer science at Cambridge, um, we came to the conclusion that the disappearance of devices like the BBC Micro, the replacement of the BBC Micro with uh, uh, machines like you know, games consoles and stuff. The, the, you know, no one ever bought a games console and then accidentally became a computer programmer as a result. Um, <laughs> and, you know, that's sort of uh, exciting. Um, the, um, uh, that, um, the disappearance of machines like the BBC Micro had led to this collapse. And this was really threatening our ability to continue to do computer science at the university in the UK that probably considers itself to be the best place in the UK, one of the four or five best places in the world to study computer science. So a group of us at the university thought, what can we do about it? And we thought, well, BBC Micro is a big success the first time, let's see if we do it again. And what we ended up with was this. So that had lied some about a three year, uh, three, four year journey. Um, but we ended up with the Raspberry Pi. This is the Raspberry Pi B. This was the thing that we started selling on the 29th of February 2012. Um, it's a machine which is designed to uh, be fun, programmable, robust, cost about as much as what we thought the school textbook cost, and we thought school textbooks cost, cost 25 bucks. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. None of us were parents, you see. Um, and, uh, you know, if, we, if we'd known what school textbooks cost, then the engineering would have been hell of a lot easier. Like so, uh, do your research. So, so that's the first lesson in your research. Um, so we made this thing, we launched it, um, it, it went out into the wild, it sold lots of units, it sold lots of units to people like us in this room, as much as it sold them to children. Um, we had um, a, uh, you know, a wonderful reaction from adult hobbyists, we had a wonderful reaction from education, and I think in part because of, uh, you know, in part because of uh, uh, the contribution of Ruffin Pi, but also the kind of contribution that's broader, there's been a broader kind of awakening to the idea that we have a problem, uh, a lot of other organisations have been trying to solve the same problem at the same time. And what we ended up with was this. Right. Wow. <laughs> and I, you know, I, this is such a lovely, this is such a lovely graph because what this graph says is we have more, we have 10, 20, 30 percent more people applying to study computer science at Cambridge last year than we had at the height of the dot com boom, when people thought that computer, computer science was going to be able to. And, what's that? Yeah, 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 yeah. So you know, this is this is this is lovely. I, I would love to be able to. Uh, I'd love to be able to claim credit for this. Uh, you'll notice that actually it starts a little before we're asking high. So I think that this is what you're seeing here. Okay, maybe we can claim credit for some of the stuff in the last couple of years. What you're seeing here, I think, is actually the maker movement in significant part. You know, the UK is a it's a little way behind it. It's doing okay. It's a little way behind North America in terms of the prevalence of what you recognise as maker culture. But I think what you're seeing here is you're seeing a curve which is caused by a kind of a broad awareness of kids brought enthusiasm among young people for making stuff. You know, for doing things that look like engineering. If you're doing something that looks like engineering when you're a 12 year old, you're a hell of a lot more likely to think that you're going to go and do one of the engineering disciplines when you're something like college. So that's been fantastic for us. Um, our expectation with Raspberry Pi was that we were going to sell you know, a thousand, ten thousand of them, and that our, um, our contribution would be the existence of the Raspberry Pi. Would, was, you know, um, we never thought that we were going to sell Raspberry Pi to make money and then spend the money on good works. We are a charity. Money can't escape. It's a closed loop. Right? So money can't escape from the, sort of the pockets of the shareholders or something. Um, the fact that we sold lots of Raspberry Pi to make a good bit of money has allowed us to do a bunch of stuff that we never thought we'd be able to do. So this is our website, raspberrypi.org. Um, we are a, an enormous producer now of free educational, Creative Commons licensed um, educational resource materials for computing and STEM. Um, there are big schemes of work that you can come to RaspberryPi.org. Um, they're not even Raspberry Pi specific. You, know, you want to find uh, some resources on teaching somebody Scratch on PC or another small world computer, you can come to RaspberryPi.org, download it for free. And of course, because it's very common, you can remix it to whatever you want. So that's been lovely. Um, the other thing, I never saw myself uh, being in the teacher training business. Um, but what we've been able to do over the last year is we started a thing called Pi Academy. Um, which is a teacher training uh, activity. We've had some wonderful change in the uh, computing curriculum in the UK, and we now have a, a you know, really rigorous, robust computing curriculum. Um, but the government has invested almost no money 
in preparing teachers to train. Um, so every month we get 25 teachers. This is just starting. This is getting worse. Every month we get 25 teachers. We take the teachers from North America. So if there's anybody in the room who would be interested in doing this, come to our website and check it out. It's called Python. Um, we get 25 teachers into our offices. We give them a two-day course, uh, which is free. All you have to do is pay for your travel and your accommodation. Um, and we teach you how to deliver a really uh, rigorous, robust computing education using Raspberry Pi. So we've been able to branch out and do all of these kind of fun things that we never imagined doing. Um, I'm going to try this again. Try this. Oops. That's it. There it was. Fleeting moment. Here we are. Anyone in the room know who this guy is? Nobody who came to my Magic Con talk the other day. Anyone? It's Otto von Bismarck. Yeah, great, greatest German statesman of the 19th century. Um, um, Otto von Bismarck is supposed to have had a, uh, a really, yeah, apparently there's no evidence that he said this, but he's supposed to have this wonderful saying, which is that God, looking across the Atlantic, he said that you know, God reserves a special providence for um, fools, drunkards in the United States of America. Uh, <laughs> Because you're looking across the Atlantic, everything just seems to go right over the hill all the time. Um, I think that you know we've been enormously lucky in doing Raspberry Pi. I sort of feel we need to tack ourselves onto the end of, of Bismarck's list. Um, we um, so I'm always kind of a little reluctant to try and draw conclusions from Raspberry Pi, try and draw lessons for other people because I think one of the, the biggest lessons we've got is be very very lucky. Um, and you're bump into a little more some people, uh, but I'm going to try it. Um, so very quickly. Um, Lesson number one, Western manufacture works. Uh, we build Raspberry Pi, we don't build Raspberry Well, when we started doing Raspberry Pi, we started trying to build it in Shenzhen. Um, we were successful at building it in Shenzhen. We were probably luckier in our Shenzhen experience than anyone else I've ever met. Um, but the wonderful thing for us was we still six months into Raspberry Pi, we could make it more cheaply in, in Wales. It's been built in South Wales. Now this is a Sony factory in South Wales that builds Raspberry Pi as a piece of contract work. Um, a big realization for me is uh, with Raspberry Pi is that the era of it being cheaper to make low-touch products in Shenzhen ended about five years ago. Um, if you're trying to build your Lego for a product, give some thought to building it in your local country. You know, you really can. Um, I, 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 just, I would hate you know, um, I'm very fond of these guys because they're in South Wales. South Wales, kind of, there's a lot of parallels between South Wales and Detroit, right? You know, uh, 100 years ago, South Wales was this place. 100 years ago, South Wales was Silicon Valley. The first million pound check was written in South Wales. The best was steel process, which is what Carnegie made all his money uh, out of, was invented in South Wales about five miles from where I was born. Um, South Wales had a pretty tough 30 years. And one of, so for me, one of the biggest realizations with Raspberry Pi is that um, our old manufacturing highlights in the UK are competitive. So that was, that was fun. Um, that said, if you want to do this, you've got to be prepared to invest. You've got to be prepared to optimize, you've got to be prepared to invest. You can't just bring your product back from Shenzhen and you produce the same product with the same production process. You do have to take account of the fact that um, uh, your labor costs are always going to be high. Um, we have been very lucky in our contract manufacturing partner, Sony, they've been prepared to invest massively. This is a um, little uh, $50,000 trinket, um, which you fit onto a, a surface map machine that you can use that allows you to solder down um, what we call pipe memory. Um, Healthcare.gov, that's, that's a great catastrophe out here, right? And it's easy for us here to say, oh man, there's government people, you know, how do they, how do they not understand how to procure software? And of course what it turns out, you know, we are, in the Raspberry Pi, we're really, really very, very bright at doing software and hardware, and we didn't know anything about this. We, it wasn't just that we didn't know how to do injective molding, we didn't know how to choose other, how to choose suppliers who were good. So you know, we were that far down in the sort of, you know, our ignorance was, was stunned. Um, so that's been a, a sober realization for us for a long time, is that even though we're pretty good at some things, we can be very terrible at other things. But this is written. Please buy it. I need to make $100,000. <laughs> <laughs> um, here's, here's, here's a wonderful case that took them about a month to go back to the market. Um, so anyway, this, this thing here, um, so things I'm excited about with Raspberry Pi. Um, People building businesses around Raspberry Pi. Um, this is a product called Pivo, produced by a company called Pimeroni in the UK. Uh, they're based out of Sheffield, another one of our old kind of manufacturing heartlands uh, that's, that's seen better, that see better days. Um, Pimeroni built a multi million pound business on the back of making accessories for the Raspberry Pi, starting with casing, but then gradually moving into more and more kind of higher value around, higher value around products. Um, we have a number of these in the UK, there are some in the, in the US. You know, people are using Raspberry Pi to build their own businesses and to, you know, when they build their businesses, they're generating employment and, uh, and 
you know, helping us kind of get the message out. This slice, then, if any of you come across this or maybe acted on Kickstarter, um, it's the media center, it's an XBMC coding media center um, that uses the Raspberry Pi uh, compute module as its brains. And that's it's absolutely good. Google it, slice, uh, they've got some absolutely wonderful videos. And we're hoping over the next year, it's like we're going to see more stuff like this. Um, what else? Oh, yeah, this thing. And I don't know if any of you saw this video from Bill. Um, we launched Raspberry Pi 2 back in, back in the start of February. Um, we announced two things. One, a Raspberry Pi 2, which is six times as powerful as Raspberry Pi 1, has twice the memory and costs the same $35. Um, and we announced another thing on the same day, which is it will run Windows. Uh, we have an enormous amount of support from Microsoft in doing this. Um, they released uh, a three months ago wait, and then they released the first developer preview a couple of weeks ago. And as part of that, they did a lovely demo on stage with this little truck here. And the little truck has got a Raspberry Pi. It drives around, it's like, oh, you know, a little truck running Windows, that was kind of fun. And then they paired it up with HoloLens, and they did this wonderful demo um, of this, this, this chap is called B15. Um, and when you look at him through a HoloLens, you don't just see B15 in the little truck, you see B15 in the cheap little robot as well. Um, why is Windows exciting? Why is Windows on Raspberry Pi exciting? Windows on Raspberry Pi is exciting because of the tool chain. For me, because of the tool chain. It's exciting because it lets people um, who are it lets people who are familiar with Visual Studio, which let's face it is a lot of us, it lets people who are familiar with Visual Studio into that world of making small board computers without having to, without having to you know, learn, learn a whole new teacher. Um, and that's really useful to us because often it's those people, the projects that adults do with Raspberry Pi, that provide us with the next generation of uh, new projects and kids. So yeah, Windows on Raspberry Pi, it's all the fun, and there's a, there's a demo of that in the tent outside. And one more thing that's exciting for me, um, we, we, launched, um, we launched Raspberry Pi 2 at the same price um, as Raspberry Pi 1, as Raspberry Pi 1 Big Plus. Um, that was actually quite difficult because it's got twice as much memory, a more expensive processor, and about 100 more components on the PCB. So we had to do an enormous amount of production optimization, like I mentioned earlier, production optimization and investment. We did a vast amount of optimization and investment to be able to uh, do that. And that had a wonderful side effect. It actually took us a month or two to figure out that it had this wonderful side effect. When we placed our next, I like mentioned, we don't like to read our stuff. We placed our next purchase order for Raspberry Pi B Plus. We noticed something with all of those production optimizations uh, had reduced the cost of B Plus a little bit. Um, so yeah, this week, this is, this is kind of fun. It's kind of fun to be able to go and do a product launch announcement for a product you've been selling for over a year. Um, the, uh, the big news for us this week is that we've been able to cover the price of Raspberry Pi B Plus, uh, which is what we were selling in, in, in very large amounts in January at $35. We were able to cut that to $25. So we now have this really nice tiered pricing. We have Raspberry Pi Model A Plus at $20. We have Raspberry Pi B Plus now at $25. And then we have the, the, the Raspberry Pi 2 at $35. So we have this kind of progression. We have you know, down at the bottom price points. We have, I think, I'm hoping, a really attractive way for makers and young people to get involved in the Raspberry Pi Pi on kind of pocket money and amounts of cash. Um, so that's, that's, that, that's it. I know that's the last slide. I'm going to leave that up because it's my slide. Um, anyway, thanks very much. I think I've saved six minutes, I hope, for questions. Thank you for some questions.